And welcome to Risk and Reward. I'm Cheryl Cassoni. I'm in for Deirdre Bolton tonight. Children targeted by ISIS. At least 12 under the age of 16 injured. ISIS now taking responsibility for the attack. And authorities have identified the suicide bomber as 22-year-old British citizen of Libyan origin, Salman Abedi. He detonated an improvised explosive device outside near the exit as young audience members were leaving the show that had just ended. The first victim of the explosion has been identified, 18-year-old Georgina Bethany Callender. She was an Ariana Grande super fan. She posted this picture taken two years ago right before last night's concert, saying she was, quote, so excited to see her again. The youngest victim has been identified as Sappy Rose Russos, a beautiful eight-year-old little girl. And there she is, National Center for Policy Analysis Executive Director and former Florida Congressman, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West is with me to talk about all of this. Colonel, you know, with this news just coming, I want to ask you, this is breaking news in the last hour, that British Prime Minister Theresa May did increase the terror threat level. She went from severe to critical. That's the highest level in Britain. Does that mean that further attacks are imminent? Do you think that they learned something today that added to that decision? Well, it's good to be with you, Cheryl, and I would hope that they had learned something from the intelligence that they had gathered. Uh, we know that there was another individual that was arrested, but the thing that we have to come to understand was that Theresa May is now the prime minister, but previous to that, she did time as the home secretary. And when you read reports about the fact that in England they have some 3,000 that are on their terrorist watch list, and then there's been another four to 500 that have left England, gone to uh, the Middle East to fight and be trained by ISIS, and have re-entered that country. And I find it quite ironic when you have an England that is banning a talk radio host by the name of Michael Savage, but yet they're free, freely allowing the transit of individuals to go into uh, terror zones and come back and to continue to do what we saw happen well, but, last but night. But, Colonel, though, I think that, that we should say, though, that Britain is a country that's in transition. After the vote to leave the European Union, one of the biggest reasons that that was a yes vote mm -hmm. at the time was because of the immigration problem. But this individual was born in Britain. He was of Libyan origin, but he was born there. He was a citizen. Absolutely. And so that, I think, raises well, that's, that's the question. That's part of the homegrown. The homegrown. But, you know, you, you yeah. have to wonder, though, are these immigrants coming in and actually, you know, bringing in jihadi ideals and kind of infiltrating, say, mosques in London, which we've heard stories of? Or do you think that this is maybe the ISIS internet age where they inspire people who are maybe young and maybe vulnerable to jihadi ways of thinking? Well, you do have the online threat that ISIS has been able to use quite well, and we have not blocked that. But also you have these radical clerics that are being sponsored by a lot of the country's leaders that uh, President Trump stood before, to include Saudi Arabia, that are allowing these Wahhabist uh, ideologies to be promulgated in a lot of these mosques that, not just in England, but all across Europe and even here in the United States of America. So I think we do have an issue with this domestic homegrown terrorism. We do have these uh, pockets of radicalization that is going on, and we have to confront that as well as the online threats that we see from groups such as ISIS and others. Right. You know, I, and I think, too, what is so troubling is them targeting young children because we've, we've actually seen in online activity in chat rooms that jihadis have been t is quoted as saying that they wanted to uh, go after the younger, go after children mm -hmm. to upset take off balance uh, the adults in their lives. And I want to talk about soft targets with you because it seems to me they're becoming more and more of a reality in Europe, whether it's, it's Paris, whether it's Brussels, southern France, now Manchester. Is this threat getting bigger? And do you think that the soft target threat is imminent for the U.S.? Well, of course it is. I mean, the thing is that there are no rules of engagement when you are dealing with the savage barbarism of Islamic jihadism. And when we talk about going after children, let's not forget what happened in Beslan in Russia, where the Islamic terrorists of the Chechenian descent uh, murdered and gunned down young school children there. So when this is about terrorism, there is no age, there is no uh, race, there is nothing that precludes mm -hmm. them from going after anyone. And we saw that in 9-11 here. We saw that with Saeed Farouk and Tashfeen Malik in San Bernardino. We saw that with Omar Mateen in Orlando. And we saw that with the Sarnia brothers in Boston. So they've already done that here. Well, I do want to switch to another big news item with you of the day, something we're talking about on the Business Network, and that's the budget. Um, critics are saying that President Trump's budget cuts too deeply into Medicaid 
and anti-poverty efforts. Colonel, what do you think of the president's proposal that was outlined today? Well, I think one of the critical things the American people must come to understand in the last eight years of the Barack Obama administration, we saw an incredible increase of Americans in poverty and food stamps. We saw the repudiation of the work requirements that came from the, the uh, Clinton administration for people to qualify for welfare benefits. The mandatory spending side of our budget is uh, 64 to 66 percent of our federal budget. That is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and net interest of the debt. We have already seen that uh, no one wants to touch Medicare and Social Security. So therefore, we need to have economic growth so we get most of Americans off of Medicaid, which is an indication that you're putting more people into poverty, and get people off of the government subsistence by way of food stamps. And the issue of Medicaid is certainly a big topic when it comes to the health care bill, which is, you know, procedurally heading to the Senate at this point. I, I also want to ask you about the fact that, you know, one of the things that struck me today when Mick Mulvaney was out there uh, at the White House giving the briefing to reporters was this really kind of rosy projection about GDP, about growth mm -hmm. in the U.S. I mean, we've been at this a long time, sir. You and I both know that this economy has been struggling. There's been a lot of bumps in the road. Um, mm -hmm. But for it to work, they're talking about 3% economic growth. Do you think that's possible considering today's environment? I think it's absolutely possible, but you need to have the economic policies, the tax policies and regulatory policies, as well as the monetary policies that enable economic growth, true free market economic growth, and not the uh, crony capitalistic uh, manipulations from government that we've seen over the past eight years. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of our small, medium, and large corporation and businesses to, so that they can hire Americans, we can right. get back to three, would, maybe even four percent And GDP that would be growth. tax for that would be tax reform, which if we can get past all these other issues that are happening, maybe get back to that discussion. I know the markets would like to see that as well, Colonel. Um, thank you very much. It was good to have you on this evening. My pleasure. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, I want to get back.